Will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we just sang, we ask that you would teach us to follow your Son as our leader, that we would learn from him as our teacher. And today I ask also that you would equip us to look to him as our great high priest. We ask this in his name, the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. Amen. The text for this morning's message is the epistle reading, this letter, portion of a letter written to the Hebrews. And this morning I would encourage you to uh, keep the text in front of you in some manner. If you have it on your phone, uh, that would be ideal. Um, I used the ESV when preparing the text because I forgot the Pew Bibles were in IV. So if you can get the ESV on your phone and follow along, if not, uh, perhaps the Pew Bible will be a good resource to you as we examine this text verse by verse. Also, if you are a note-taking person, I'll let you know that unlike most of my ser sermons, this one actually does lend itself to the taking of notes a little bit more than usual. So with those two items, again, the text Hebrews chapter 5, the first 10 verses. Grace, mercy, and peace to you all through God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you have ever written a compare contrast essay? Probably most of you. It looks like most of you. Well, Joy recently learned those words at school. And, and she told me what they meant. We were getting in the car, and she said, I learned compare contrast, and compare means the same, and contrast means different. And I was like, yeah, that's right. I was very impressed. And as I was driving along, and I was, I was thinking I might be a little biased, but I, I think I also probably just have the smartest kindergartner in the world. And as I was driving along on the way home from school, I started thinking about the last compare-contrast essay that I wrote. It was in my first year of college. My English prof, had, she had us write one in order to, to see how well we could use this format to build an argument for something. And so at first, I was tempted to compare and contrast this crummy assignment with other assignments for more fun classes, but I didn't do that, although my sarcastic side still won out in the end, because I wrote a lengthy, scholarly, heavily footnoted paper contrasting and comparing apples and oranges. Because, you know, people always say, you can't compare. Yes, you can. You can compare apples and oranges. And, and so compare and contrast was on my mind, and then I got to our epistle reading. And discover that compare and contrast is pretty much what the author of the book of Hebrews is up to. In this little section we have before us. It's a compare and a contrast with the purpose of building an argument. Of making a case. And the point that he wants to make is that Jesus is a continuation of, a refinement of, a new and better manifestation of the Old Testament office of the high priest. And the high priest, you'll remember, is the dude who was assigned the job of presenting gifts and sacrifices to God as an atonement, a payment for the sins of the people. And so today I would invite you to walk through this text with me as we see both the comparisons, what's the same, but also the contrasts. What's different between Jesus and all of these other high priests and, and priests in the Old Testament. And we start with verses 1, 4, and 5. And I know I'm already out of order. But these, these three verses are all compare verses. They have something in common. Verse 1, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And then verse 4, no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called 
by God, just as Aaron, the head high priest of the Old Testament was. So also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. So here we have both Christ and the priests of the Old Testament, and what they have in common is that they were chosen. Did you hear all of those chosen words? Called, appointed, chosen. There was an external call. It wasn't as if someone could just decide, hey, I want to be a priest, and then, bam, they're a priest. No, no. No, this wasn't an office to be sought out, to be sought after for your own glory or or benefit. It was something you were appointed to. And Christ, like all priests, didn't do what he did because it would place him in an enviable social position, because he would get something out of it. He did what he did for us because he was appointed. Verse 2, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward because he himself is beset with weakness. Another compare verse. It's the same. Whether it's Christ or, or the Old Testament priest, priests must be able to sympathize. Which is hard to do, isn't it? Uh, in our world of technological and informational bubbles, psychologists and sociologists are noticing that empathy is becoming an increasingly rare trait. We are becoming measurably more obsessed with ourselves at the expense of not being able to sympathize with others, and certainly those with whom we disagree on big things. This is so much the case. This is such a statistically provable development, this transition towards self-centeredness that we're we're starting to see books like this one that arrived in in my mail this week, well-received by two PhDs with the lovely and rather intimidating title of The Narcissism Epidemic. This is us. And it's a little bit scary. But the point is, a priest could not be one of these sort of fellows. A priest had to be able to sympathize. He must be able to sympathize because his his goal is to treat those who are in need of the sacrifices he offers with gentleness rather than a a condescending self-righteousness. And the reason he could sympathize, the text says, is because he was himself beset with weakness. It's startling to remember sometimes, but Jesus was beset with weakness. True, it was a weakness that that didn't result in sin, but it was weakness nonetheless. Jesus knows full well what it's like to live in a world that sometimes just stinks. He knows what it's like to to wake up in the middle of the night and stub your toe. Or to go out and start your day and have someone approach you and then just belittle you. Jesus knows. And so he deals with you gently. Like any good high priest, he too can sympathize. But that's where the contrasts begin. The compare is done. The contrasts are here for the rest of our text. It's differences from this point out because of verse 3. Verse 3, because of this, he, that is the Old Testament priest, is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does those of the people. In other words, it's great that the Old Testament priest can sympathize And it's great that he shares our weaknesses in common with us. But unfortunately, for these Old Testament priests, their weaknesses always meant more sacrifices. 
because their weaknesses meant more sin, their own sin. The stubbed toe in the middle of the night results in a cursing of God's name. The belittling remark earns an equally scathing remark in response. Where fallen humanity adds to the pile of sins, Jesus does not. He's different. He's a different kind of priest. In fact, that's what verse 6 is getting at when it says of Jesus, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek was a different kind of priest. This dude pops up way, way, way on back in the book of Genesis. And Melchizedek just kind of shows up out of the blue, out of left field. It's almost bizarre. Like, where did this come from? Sort of like God in a manger. Where does this come from? Sort of out of the blue like that. Anyways... Here is Melchizedek, and he he shows up, and we know he's legit because he blesses Abraham. He receives uh, an offering from Abraham, stuff legit priests do, only there's a twist. Melchizedek isn't from the official line of priests, descended from Aaron, because Aaron hasn't even been born yet. The line of priests doesn't exist. It's bizarre. Melchizedek just shows up. And he is a legit priest, but of a completely different caliber. Sort of like Jesus. And what makes Jesus so different? Well, the contrasts continue in verse 7. Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Really, two big differences here. First, instead of cows and sheep and and bulls, Jesus offered up a different sacrifice. His life. Specifically, he offered up, the text says, prayers. Now, other priests would do this too, but Jesus offered up prayers for you. Did you know that while he was on earth, Jesus Christ prayed for you? John 17, if you want to look it up when you get home today. But beyond prayers, not just prayers, but tears, Christ wept over his friend Lazarus who had died. He wept over his people who were rejecting him. And these holy tears counted before God as more than all the burnt offerings the Old Testament priests could muster. But the second big contrast here is that these prayers were heard, the text says, because of the personal reverence of Christ. Now, as a rule, the validity of the priest's actions in the Old Testament did not depend on the personal piety of the priest. Same thing with pastors today. The validity of pastors' actions do not depend on his own personal righteousness. And thank goodness, because then behold the anguish when your priest or pastor is revealed to be a fellow sinful person. By design, The sacrifices and prayers of these priests were accepted because of their office, not because of their person. But with Jesus, we can't say that. Here we have a high priest who is so reverent, so devoted, so committed to God's ways that not only is his office perfectly reliable, but he as a person is perfectly reliable. Reliably perfect as a person. This is the contrast apparent in verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through 
what he suffered. Now here is something new. He suffered. Not only is this priest perfectly reverent, perfectly obedient, this priest suffers. This priest does not bring the sacrifice. This priest is the sacrifice. An Old Testament priest would bring suffering to sacrificial animals in order to pay for the sins of the people, his own included. But this priest, who has no sins, brings himself to suffer, obedient to death, even death on a cross. Finally, verses 9 and 10. Being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who would obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So we we close out with strange old Melchizedek again. So we are again being pointed to the radical contrast, the radical differentness of this high priest. And what is so different? Well, in this verse, we see first that he was made perfect. Now this, I grant you, could be more than a bit confusing. This could be a lot confusing. He was made perfect. The Greek word here is one that you normally hear as fulfilled or complete. The concepts are a little tricky to kind of put into English, but it's the idea of being realized, of being lived out. It's like how in school, if you perfectly ace a test, That test demonstrates you've got a complete mastery of the material. A complete mastery that that obviously existed before you took the test. But the test is is the point at which this this mastery is shown. The point at which it's, it's lived out. So too, Jesus was shown to be completely obedient and completely sufficient at one particular point. One test, if you will. And what is that? Well, back to the the previous verse. As he learned obedience through what he suffered, through the cross. The cross is the proof of Christ's obedience, his perfect obedience, because no Old Testament priest ever did anything like this. None could And so Jesus has become, as the the concluding verses say, the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Not a source, the source. The source of your salvation, the source of mine. As the old hymn says, no other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of The suffering of Jesus. You can make some comparisons, if you like. And we've made them. But the more you make the comparisons, the more you realize that truly this high priest is beyond compare. This high priest, he is yours. He is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the everlasting high priest source of your salvation. Amen.